from the Wilting Studios of Univest at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It is time for another tomato killing episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks. You bet your garden. Are nearby black walnut trees the cause of your tomato plant failures? I'm Mike McGrath. And on today's show, we'll discuss the latest research on the poisonous potential of black walnut roots and reveal some surprising ways you can limit their allopathic effects. Plus, a heap in helping of your fabulous phone call questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and ideologically imprecise inculcations. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you negotiating a truce between your walnuts and tomatoes right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. We got a lot to do today, so we better hop right to your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444, 888-492-9444. Rick, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hello, Mike. How are you today? I am just ducky. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking my call. Oh, thank you for making it. Uh, where are you? I'm in Sladington, Pennsylvania. I'm just about four miles south of the Appalachian Trail. I have a beautiful view of it from uh, my bath deck. Mm. And um, I, I know of Sladington. Uh, did they used to mine slate there? They, they indeed did. Um, whenever I um, spell the name of the town for people, I always add they used to mine slate here because they don't know if you're saying Sladington or some variety of it. So they they at least get S O A T correctly. Yeah, my uh when we bought the house that, you know, I still live in, we, we had a slate roof. Um yeah. and, you know, obviously the house was old, but uh <laughs> we finally did decide to go uh, the standard way because when those if the piece of slate <laughs> slid off during a windstorm, <laughs> you hope you were nowhere nearby. Yeah, I can imagine those are actually pretty heavy roofs. I know they've migrated away from that with asphalt and things, but uh, in, in fact, in school rooms, they used to have the slate blackboards and yep. they've gotten away from that too. So um, they, they still have a market for slate, but not in, in terms of those products. Oh, yeah. And no. I, I've been, I mean, been, slate I've been is great. Places up here. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, you didn't call about slate. What can we do for you? Um, I, I was just wondering if you ever, um, perhaps you did this yourself in your life or other people have, have posed this to you, but I find that most of my gardening is related to either personal memorials, either memorials of people or memorials of experience I've, experiences I've had in my life. And um, when I started thinking about the plants that are in my yard or the plants that are inside my house, I, it, it struck me, I never really considered it, but it struck me how many of those, probably 98% of the things I have, have some kind of connection like that. Every once in a while, um, that topic will come up frequently, and then it won't come up again for maybe a year. And I have, uh, I have several thoughts about it. It scares me when someone who has never gardened before wants to plant a tree um, to honor a loved one who has, you know, gone away. And because, you know, if you don't know what you're doing um, and the tree dies, you're going to feel just as bad again. And but with an experienced gardener who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> the inexperienced ones, by the way, I say buy a really nice park bench and put a plaque on it. 
you know, right, nothing, right. nothing bad is going to happen. If you talk about an experience, I, I mean, I, I started this without thinking about it. When I was 20 years old, my, my fall semester down at Duke, we were signing the lease for our apartment and I broke off a piece of a pothos plant that was in the office. I still have that plant today. It's like 45 years old. And I, I did that. I, I, of course, at that time, I didn't own a house and had no place to plant things. So I didn't start with outside things, but I had already started accumulating that. I did that with a philodendron in the hospital pharmacy I worked in. I still have that. Um, the thing that really brought it to mind, we sold my folks' house this past February, and I found myself moving a lot of the plants, um, things like coral bells that were cared for by my mom. They have a new home up here in Sladington. Um, hydrangeas, several of them, azaleas and rhododendrons, all of them I've brought here. Um, many things I accumulated like over over a period of time in my life. For, for me, this is like the equivalent of when people take photos and they have them on tables inside their house. It, it's, it's not the person, you're not looking at the person, but you look at the photo and it just brings back a flood of memories either of that person or of some experience that you had in your life. And that's what the plants do for me when I walk out in my garden um, and see these plants. Um, things come in the flower a particular time of year. I can just recall um, the last bouquet I made for my mom of, of a Shasta, Shasta daisy and other flowers. Um, those are just getting ready to come into bloom. And it, it just, those, those really fill the memories um, and, and I understand what you're saying about if you're inexperienced and you you have the original loss and then you lose the plant as well. But um, I'm 66 now. The first plants I broke off in the landlord's office was back when I was 20. So <laughs> I I have a little bit of experience um, under my belt and I've had good success in getting things to survive being transplanted several times. But one of the things I, I really like um, when my mom was small growing up in cement and she used to walk into their yard up a set of steps. And those concrete steps are still there. She was born in 1924, but she she used to walk under this lilac bush. And I, I was able to propagate, you know, the lilac is still alive. And I brought that up here. So it's just a, a wealth of historical things that connect me, I feel, with either memories from the past or people from the past. Um, so I, I think I think it's a it's a really cool um, thing I, I didn't realize how much of it I had done until I really started thinking about wow that came from there and this came from this particular experience. Well, there is a unique sensory experience when, especially for me, with spring blooming uh, flowers that have a scent um, that can trigger. Uh, very intense memories, and right. it sounds like you know what you're doing. Now, I do have to mention, and I'm not saying you did anything wrong, but I do have to mention to uh, to our listeners that when you sell a home, the landscaping is part of the home, and you can't remove any actual plants without the new owner's permission. And... Um, you know, a lot of people will actually have that as a rider in right. uh, in the agreement. Uh, but there's nothing to say that you can't, you know, cut new shoots in the spring for propagation. And right. um, I presume you did everything, you know, correctly. I, I think yeah. I think it's great. Um, one thing comes to mind is if you feel like you have a, 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 a season that's not as evocative. Think about finding a plant that is in full flower and blooms at that time of year. So you always, you know, have something going on uh, that has significant meaning to you personally. Right. right. And right. Um, I, I, I still think, even though you obviously... Um, are going to be good at caring for these plants. I still think you should put a bench out there so, you know, you can sit and be with the plants and, and be with your late mom. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you, if you saw my, if you saw an aerial view of my property, you would kind of chuckle because I'm, I'm kind of surrounded by desert, um, 
where people just have the the minimum amount of plantings and i i kind of uh, surround myself um Apart, I understand your suggestion about the bench, but I have I, I just have a wealth of things that when I walk around, it's just I'm really proud of the work I've done. It it takes a lot of work, and uh, but it's it's something that really pays off. One other consideration I, I would give, you know, people are moving plants from area B to or area A to area B is you don't want to be transplanting. Um, the plan along with pest problems and Correct. insect problems, disease problems. I actually worked as the uh, forest in- insect and disease specialist for the state of Maryland, so I was always careful to make sure that nothing was coming along with the ride. Um, but that's a consideration that people, you know, really shouldn't be moving things without making sure that that it's safe to move them as well. Especially from state to state. Correct. You Correct. Know. Don't don't cross state lines <laughs> with young plants. All right, right. listen, I th- I think it's I think it's great. Thank you for sharing your story with us, and um, it's absolutely wonderful. And it's nice to have that topic come up again. Okay, Mike. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you again for making it. Take care now. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody that this is the time of year when stink bugs will try to enter your house to hibernate for the winter. They congregate on the south-facing side of light-colored homes, which is where you will place your stink bug traps, basically just hanging pizza boxes with small holes drilled into the sides. It's like the Roach Motel. The stink bugs go in, but they don't check out. But don't you go ordering lots of pizzas just yet, because we'll be right back with a new look at Black Walnuts and more of your fabulous phone calls. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. 888-492-9444. 888-492-9444. Kelly, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Hello, Kelly. How you doing? I'm doing good. We're having a, a kind of a nice fall day today here. Where's here? We're in eastern North Carolina in a little town called Winterville. Uh, probably the most honest name in the Carolinas, right? <laughs> it it uh, generally isn't terribly cool here. More humid than cool. Yeah, but you you, uh, you watch the national news hoping to see an ice storm back east, right? We've we've had a few, but uh, they they can be quite eventful in this p- part of the woods. Now, um, you sent uh, you emailed us a couple of pictures, and yeah. um, I just I just saw them for the first time, and if they're what I think, oh my goodness, this is sad. Um, <laughs> you you had a pond, and it died. Uh, basically, it's dried up. Um, it, it, I think it's a groundwater pond. Uh, it doesn't have any water flowing into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's quite quite large. It's uh, about thirty by a hundred feet. Um, and most of the time, it's been about half full. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're in a low lowland area, the it, assuming that it's just groundwater that accumulates there. But in the last three years, it's been really dry. 
uh, drought in a couple of those years, and it has dried up to nothing. Yeah, it's I really mean, just a you know bowl of uh, of weeds. That uh, the these photos are some of the most dramatic I've ever seen. In the first picture, <laughs> you can see the pond, and I believe those are. Um, Oh, uh, what am I thinking? Water irises growing at the side? Yes. Yes. And the the Indeed. next shot doesn't look like the same place. There's nothing. That that was taken uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We had to have someone come in and clean it out. We were expecting uh, the first tropical storm to, to come in inland and uh, we wanted to make sure it was cleared out before any rain might accumulate well uh, so, um, but you i thought you wanted the water we do but it the weeds okay so it's been totally dry for three years mm. and we've gone in now for the third time and cleaned the the weeds the weeds are over my head mm-hmm for a good part of the summer. And so we cleared it out to be ready for the weeds. Right. Or not the weeds. I know the what water. you mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so this... what I really am hoping to, to find out is if, if uh, there's any easier way to maintain and keep this ready for water. <laughs> um, I think so. Now, water gardens are not my specialty, um, but I know enough to be dangerous. And <laughs> one of the old techniques, I mean, this goes back to Roman and Greek times, is to have um, the bed. I mean, you've got a trench there now, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and probably don't try to make it as big as it once was, but pick the best spot, um, maybe even just for your viewing and visiting pleasure, and either you and your family or, you know, a landscaper can come in and either manually or with a machine pound the soil down until the point where it doesn't um, leach water anymore. Um, mm. you might even want to hedge your bets by figuring out, you know, a true pond, you know, a man-made pond mm-hmm. and okay. making or having somebody install little dams at each end. So if you've got something that will stop the water from spreading out, and you have pounded the soil. Let, let me see. Uh, you said you're in North Carolina. Um, how close are you to the ocean? It, it's about a two-hour drive. Good, good, in this case, because that means your yeah. your soil is heavy clay. No. No? No, it's, it's really more sandy. Hmm. Well, you know... They might actually, you know, this is like, you know, the the opposite of everything I believe in. But in this case, you you might want to have them lay some clay down (laughs) and and pound that. Um, But I think instead of what you had, um, my advice would be to build a true... You know, I hate to use the word artificial, but it's it's accurate in this case uh, because mm-hmm. the natural one was beautiful. But, yeah. you know, climate change, you know, all the rules, are, all the rules are broken. Nature is trying to compensate as best she can. Um, but we're hammering the poor planet, as you know. Mm-hmm. So I agree. You know, I, I think isolate an area. Damn it at both ends, darn it at both ends for the children listening, Mm -hmm. and have the soil pounded down. They actually sell very large liners for ponds. Mm -hmm. 
if you right. if you want to you know really ensure that it's going to fill up um and you might want to consider that if your soil is sandy but uh mm-hmm. you know a good pounding um make sure it can't drain out the ends and then you'll have a more compact area that you can have fun planting okay <laughs> but I'm, I'm sorry i mean i i see what you lost <laughs> Yeah, it, it it has been really beautiful um, and and such a, a a nice thing for for the the critters in the neighborhood and uh, the things that we'd see wandering through. Having so. a pond um, is great pest prevention because it attracts mm-hmm. frogs and toads, and yeah. they eat a lot of pest insects, and they're fun to have around. Mhm. Yes, I I enjoy our our frogs and the the spring peepers especially. Oh the yeah, they're the best. All right. <laughs> well, uh, I wish you luck, and um, you know, hopefully it'll work. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Same here. You take care, and okay. bye bye. Eric. Welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hey, thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm just ducky, Eric. How are you, sir? (laughs) I'm doing all right. I'm uh, out on a service call and uh, taking a minute to give you a chat. Okay, great. Uh, Where are you located? Where is your garden located? Whatever. Well, um, I'm actually located in southwest Iowa region. Um, I'm in Clorinda, Iowa is where my house is. Okay. Uh, but the question is regarding a um, uh, disc golf course that I like to go to that is a little bit away from my home. Okay. But it's at a lake, and at hole 11, uh, the butterflies there, which appear to be um, – Hackberry emperor butterflies. Okay. Uh, they, in the past three years, they have flocked to me and landed all over me and my disc golf equipment, um, sort of ignoring my friends, but giving them some attention. But um, usually when I go there, I get totally bombarded by these guys. Uh, this year, there was none. I mean, not one. Mm. Um, so I was... Uh, leaving a message on there on your message machine because I heard that one lady's phone call about not having butterflies and that kind of tripped my trigger to give you a call. Um, there is a consensus that the number of butterflies in general is down. Now I'm interested that when they were there in good numbers that they came to you. And so I have to ask you a personal question and I don't want sure. you to, I don't want you to get mad at me. Okay. Do you sweat a lot? Actually, I do the opposite. I have a hard time sweating. Really? Be- um, because yeah. one of the lesser known ways to attract male butterflies is, especially males, is to make okay. a little mud pit and keep it moist and put a a tablespoon or a a teaspoon of salt in there. They have a salt tooth. So that's... Okay, so that'd be just like sweat. Yeah, exactly. Um, Just like sweat bees, you know, that land on you and they're not going to hurt you. They're just uh, like... They can't can't open a bag of pretzels, so you're the best chance they have. Right. (laughs) Now, you know... um, so you mentioned that this is a hackberry butterfly. Have you noticed if the golf course has cut down any hackberry trees or anything like that, any change in the landscape? No, I haven't really noticed that per se. Um, everything looked pretty normal. Um, it's a very well-kept lake. Uh, the course is very well-kept and, uh, just when we went there, it just seemed to be a big absence of the butterflies. But I also noticed that the squirrels were also a little bit vacant as well. Well, you got to uh, take the bad with the good, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Well, you know, the only thing I well, yes, there is an absence of butterflies. But as you probably already know, golf courses are notorious for overuse of lawn chemicals. And that's true. If maybe they change services, a new maintenance engineer came on the job, or some rookie just oversprayed, that would explain the lack of butterflies. Um, also, okay. also a change of landscape. Butterflies need two things. They need host plants for their caterpillars. And then later in the season, they need pollen and nectar producing plants. And if a golf okay. course changes their attitude and eliminates a lot of of pollinator-friendly plants, the butterflies are going to go somewhere else where those plants are. Gotcha. If they go nuts with the pesticides, then the butterflies are dead. Also, one of the things that comes to mind, and this doesn't necessarily answer your question, but I think it's something people need to know, is you can't have a butterfly garden and a bird garden in the same area. Um, I can't tell you how many pictures we used to get of people who thought they had were doing a World Wildlife Fund garden, and they had these crazy <laughs> little butterfly houses next to a bird feeder. And it's like, haven't you noticed all the wings <laughs> laying on the ground? So, Oh, it, yeah, that'd be bad. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, you know, birds eat butterflies. And if there was a change in the golf course that attracted more birds, which would be good, uh, it would be bad for the butterfly population. Um, Is this a course where you're a member or is it a public course or whatever? It's public and it's, it's not a ball golf course. It's actually a disc golf course. Oh, Oh, okay. Um, Well, I would imagine they're less crazy about the use of pesticides, right? Yeah, um, it's more or less, uh, it's pretty rough terrain if you're not in the fairway areas or the main park areas. And uh, rough terrain is a really good place for all the little animals to hide out and uh, have a home in there. And disc, uh, disc golf is really cool. Oh, yeah. I love playing disc golf. Well, I don't play it enough. (laughs) Somebody, none of us do enough good things. Um, (laughs) There's got to be somebody in charge, right, of the park itself. Okay. So get a hold of them and express your concern that you didn't see as many butterflies this year. Now, the culprit, now that we're off of a, a golf ball course, could well just be climate change. Um, butterflies okay. are having a really hard time. I mean, we have uh, almost lost the Western monarch butterfly. Um, you know, oh, wow. a lot of people don't know there's two different monarchs. There's one for the East Coast and there's another on the other side of the Rockies. And over the past two years, The West Coast ones were devastated by the wildfires. They can't fly through smoke or find their way or anything like that. So the more unnatural disasters we experience, uh, the harder it is on everybody. So what you could do to remedy that is say, you know, can we put up a little butterfly garden here? with host plants and pollinator plants. And it would seem, oh, cool. yeah, it would seem to be right in the, in the mindset of your disc golfer friends. And you for bet. the, for the bonus round, uh, you make little mud puddles and put a little salt in them. All right. I'll give that a whirl. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your call. It, it's good to talk about butterflies, man. Yeah. I dig butterflies. <laughs> All right. You take care and um yeah. <laughs> thank you.
All, All right. right. Take care, man. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody that it is time to be sucking up and shredding your fall leaves for compost making and garden mulching. But don't go digging back through our informational archives at the Gardens Alive website just yet to learn the best ways to do that, because we'll be right back with fascinating facts about black walnuts and more of your fascinating phone calls. I'm Fascinating Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we're in the stretch now, cats and kittens. In just a little bit, we'll get to the question of the week, which we are calling Black Walnuts, Threat or Menace? 888-492-9444. Jim. Welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Good day, sir. This is Jim in Nashville, outside of Nashville, White's Creek. How are you? I am just ducky. How's Jim? Doing good. Not ducky, but I I will say before we speak, my evil squirrels have a message for you. They scrawled it in the dirt. They said, try to catch us. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we have some fun coming up in the next couple of shows with evil squirrels. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it anyway. Um, and again, always a pleasure, uh, to hear from Nashville and Memphis. What can we do you for here? Here's my question, Mike. A few days ago, I watched a short segment on the miracle of the monarch butterfly from, from, the little egg to birth. And mm-hmm. then a few days later, I see some monarchs out in the backyard mm-hmm. and I'm sitting down and I'm looking at the garden and it's colder out here in White's Creek than Nashville. So the tomatoes are done for, they've been cold out of the ground except for the, the cherries. And I'm looking at this stack and I'm thinking, oh no, have, have monarchs and have moths, have butterflies laid eggs on these and am I interrupting that cycle? So that's my basic question. When should someone pull out the tomato plants according to the season and where they are? And what would one want to do with them? And are we indeed hurting the cycle of our flying friends? That's my question, sir. Okay, very good question. Uh, The first answer is you should pull out your tomato plants when you're sick and tired of looking at them and waiting for that one green tomato to ripen up. Pick it off the plant, bring it inside to ripen inside, and compost the tomato plants. Um, There is only one insect that uses uh, tomato as a host plant. In other words, they lay their eggs on it, a caterpillar hatches out, 
and then devours as much as the plant as it can. And that is the dreaded tomato hornworm, one of the biggest caterpillars in North America. When it strikes, it looks like deer have eaten off the top of your plants, and there are mountains of frass, a $30 word for bug poop, are really visible underneath the plants. Now, they are pestiferous, but they uh, pupate, drop, they drop into the ground as caterpillars pupate in these weird kind of armored shell things and emerge as giant sphinx moths, one of the biggest moths in North America. So they're a pest, um, but, they're, uh, but their moth stage is tremendously beautiful. So, um, and oh, one other thing, if you find a hornworm on your, uh, on your plants and it has white spines up and down the back, don't mess with it because those spines are the cocoons of beneficial wasps, very small wasps that will, um, that will uh, you know, take care of other pests in your garden, preying on them. Um, if you want to help the monarchs, you grow milkweed in your garden. That is the only. You, betcha. you got some? Yeah, that's the, everybody knows that. Even uh, even us uh, wannabe Mike McGrath know that. Oh uh, well, thank you. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there are different kinds of milkweed. Um, you should grow the ones that are recommended for your area, and uh, that will make the monarchs that return very happy because they will lay their eggs on the milkweed plants when they get back from, um, in your case, Mexico. And those eggs, of course, you know, will hatch into caterpillars that will eat the milkweed and, you know, uh, come a, a form a tremendously beautiful chrysalis. And then out of the chrysalis comes the monarchs. So the other thing you can do, and perhaps you already know this, is to have plants in flower at the end of the season uh, that produce large amounts of pollen and nectar. Uh, the absolute best ones are tithonia, or Mexican sunflower. The monarchs that emerge will really chow down on the pollen and nectar in these plants. They produce a ton of it, and that will fuel them on their way back down to their breeding grounds. Good to know. And uh, Chithonia. I think that's the. Go yes, ahead. sir. Go ahead. I was going to. I, I was. I was going to say that the Mexican sunflower should be available here, in this temperate climate. Uh, that's new information to me, and it's it's much appreciated. Yeah, that is their absolute favorite flower. There are others, uh, but you want something that blooms into the fall and produces copious amounts of nectar and pollen. And they're beautiful, man. Thank you. The Tithonia, yeah. the Mexican sunflower, they're absolutely gorgeous. Okay, Jim? Thank you for the information. Yes, and I have the highest respect for your for your knowledge. Uh, on with the day and on with the show. Thanks for taking the call, sir. Thank you very much, Jim. Take care. Bye. You guessed it, cats and kittens. It is time for the question of the week which we are calling Black Walnuts, Threat or Menace? Dan, an upper black eddy in Bucks County, PA, writes, I have two questions regarding walnut trees. One, what is the time frame for the soil around the walnut tree to still be poisoned by the juglone after I cut down the tree? Number two, should I avoid using shredded leaves on my beds if they have some walnut tree leaves in them. What about if the beds are near or under a walnut tree? Well, thanks for asking, Dan. It made me recall an exhaustive Washington State University Extension article I read over the summer, written by WSU Extension agent Susan Chacker Walker, a previous guest on our show. She explains that the belief that certain plants, especially walnuts, 
are deadly to nearby plants goes back to Roman times. This process is called allopathy, meaning, quote, death to others. And, of course, the most feared plant compound is juglone, the famed tomato kryptonite. Susan reports that the actual research on this subject is both skimpy, inconsistent, shaky, sometimes downright contradictory, and just plain made up. But one thing seems to be certain. Living and dead walnut trees contain no actual juglone. Horror, right? I didn't think that. Instead, they contain a precursor called hydrojuglone that turns into juglone when exposed to soil, which explains the long-held belief that, quote, juglone is most highly concentrated in the roots. Now comes the really weird part. Susan reports that back in 1948, the USDA launched a campaign to convince gardeners that black walnut trees were harmless, which apparently nobody believed. She adds that the few actual studies performed are no longer available, one, because it's woefully out of date and they don't use things that old anymore, and the other one because it appears to be fraudulent and or may never have existed. Before we get back to Susan's fine investigative reporting, we should try to answer Dan's questions. Now, cutting down the tree will not help because the roots will still be in the soil. If you need that area for growing, especially tomatoes, you'll have to have the stump pulled and clean out as many leftover stray roots as possible. Most research indicates that the juglone in those roots stays active for 10 to 20 years. Although one of the articles cited by Susan notes that, quote, juglone does not persist in soils with high microbial activity. We'll get back to this in a bit. The good news. Yes, you can incorporate a percentage of shredded black walnut leaves in your compost pile as they contain little of the juglone precursor. My advice has always been to limit black walnut leaves to 20% or less of your shredded leaf total. It would seem foolish to press your luck with more than that. Composting the leaves in a hot pile would also be helpful, as the microbes generated in a hot compost pile would help to denature any chemical that is present. Shredded leaf mulch. Since the precursor becomes juglone when it comes in contact with soil, it would seem a foolish risk to use the leaves directly. Finished compost that used to contain some black walnut leaves, finished meaning no raw material left showing, should be fine. Garden beds directly underneath a black walnut tree? There are so many things wrong with that sentence, it's making me dizzy. No, no, and um, no. Sounds like another call for pulling the stump. Don't forget, it isn't just the juglone here. The shade and root competition from the tree will also make that a terrible location for other plants. And now we return to Susan's excellent article. Towards the end, she provides some things that gardeners can do to limit the damage. Quote, provide adequate irrigation for landscape plants during drier, warmer weather. All plant roots compete for water, nutrients, and oxygen. The denser your plantings, the more intense that competition. Competition? Is that when you go, is that when you lose your job and they send you a check? The more intense that competition will be. I have a feeling I'll be on competition soon. Mulch well with arborist wood chips to retain soil moisture and to nourish beneficial soil life, including mycorrhizae. 
I'll step in here to suggest that a mulch of compost would be an even faster way to bring more life into your soil. And I'll take a moment to remind everyone that wood of any kind should never be mixed into the soil where it will interfere with nitrogen uptake. The mention of mycorrhizae is especially interesting, as Susan notes that research has shown that soils rich in organic matter have the ability to bind up juglone and make it less available to nearby plants. <laughs> it's like I always say, I don't care what your question is, the answer is compost. This might also be an excellent case for adding beneficial microbes to the soil, especially in the planting holes of tomatoes. You'll find products containing mycorrhizae at any good independent garden center. Of course, the opposite is true. Chemical fertilizers limit or destroy soil life. If you feed your plants repurposed explosives, like miracle Grow, Osmocote, and the like, you're depriving those plants of the positive symbiosis they need to survive. Well, that sure was an interesting look at the realities of dreaded juglone now, wasn't it? Luckily for you, you can read the details over at your leisure or your leisure because the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. Just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you will always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website. Yikes, my producer is threatening to water my walnuts if I don't get out of this studio. We must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please include your location, even if you think we know it, because we don't. You'll find all of our contact information, plus answers to your garden questions, audio of this show, audio of old shows, links to our internationally renowned podcast. It's all at our website. Say it with me, kids. YouBetYourGarden.org. You Bet Your Garden is an hour-long public radio show and podcast produced and delivered to you every week from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created by Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. Ken Queter plays our theme song. Our chief content officer is Joni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey, and our engineer is cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Keep up with what's happening with the show at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Our peerless princess of profound production is Teresa Radke, and our audio editor is the always lovely Jonas Bowen. Our mascots are Zach the Tack Wisniewski and Ducky the Dancing Duck. Our beloved and beleaguered CEO is Tim Fallon. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, reminding you that only you can prevent stink bug invasions of your home. So eat lots of pizza, and I'll see you again next week. Yeah.